welcome to Elucidations, a philosophy podcast recorded at the University of Chicago. I'm Matt Teichman. And I'm Mark Hopwood. With us today is Martin Gustafsson, professor of philosophy at Stockholm University. He is here to talk with us about philosophical pictures. Martin Gustafsson, welcome. Thank you. Wittgenstein famously opens his book, The Philosophical Investigations, with a long quotation from the philosopher Augustine about what language is and how we come to learn it. What's the idea, roughly, that's broached in that passage? Well, it's actually like a common sense description of what he thought happened when he learned language. It's not clear that this is a passage where Augustine is doing philosophy at all. And that's one thing that is puzzling about it, that Wittgenstein uses this seemingly everyday description as a starting point for a deep philosophical criticism of certain views of language. So Wittgenstein thinks there is a picture in Augustine's description, but the picture is very, very simple, very primitive. It is simply that the words in language name objects, sentences are combinations of such names. Then Wittgenstein goes on to say that in this picture of language, we find the roots of a certain idea. And the idea is that every word has a meaning. This meaning is correlated with the word. It is the object for which the word stands. And all that is ready there, I think, uh, we have something like philosophy going on. But in the very first description of the picture, this very bare description, it's not clear that this is philosophy either, that the words in language name objects, sentences are combinations of such names. It may be a useful starting point for thinking about language. It's not clear that but it's not clear that it's really a philosophical thesis or anything. So there's a standard way of reading the opening of the investigations where readers of Wittgenstein will refer to the Augustinian picture of language that is broached right at the beginning. And this then becomes the object of criticism in the rest of the book. So the book begins with this picture of language that we're supposed to find fairly intuitive, it's supposed to be appealing to us, but then Wittgenstein is going to go on to present all kinds of arguments to show why it's mistaken. And by the end of the book, we'll have realized we have to let go of it. Now you've raised some worries about this standard way of reading the opening of the book, so maybe you could tell us about those. Yeah. I think those kind of standard readings makes the so-called Augustinian picture of language much too rich, much too elaborate, right? So let me give you an example, a list of things that people have said are parts of this picture. So words are names, sentences are combinations of names, every significant word has a meaning, meaning correlated with the word is the object for which the word stands, there is primary concern with nouns and property words are secondary. The human subject is an interface between its own private essence and the world. The private essence has internal articulations that cannot yet be expressed, thus making it somehow already communicatively human. Ostension is fundamental in establishing the connection between word and object, and so on and so forth. I think it's true that all these things are things that Wittgenstein criticizes, but it's very doubtful that he would regard them as parts of this initial primitive picture that Augustine gives us in this passage he's quoting. And if you start talking about the Augustinian picture of language in these terms, it also becomes very problematic to say that the historical Augustine actually would have subscribed to such a picture. In fact, if you consider the wider context of the passage from the confessions, Augustine's confessions, it's clear already from that that some of these points are things that Augustine himself has problems with. And if you consider his more sophisticated philosophical writings, it's very clear that Augustine is problematizing some of these things, is struggling with these ideas, and uh, is not at all you know, unequivocally subscribing to these ideas. So we have a pretty intuitive conception of what language is. You know, language is sentences we say, and the sentences we say are made up of words, and the individual words in the sentences stand for things. So the word Matt stands for me, and the word cow stands for a cow, maybe, I don't know, or maybe we could dispute that. And Wittgenstein accepts this as a a valuable starting point, but perhaps he's worried about generalizing it too far or making it into a detailed theory about how all of language is. Because after all, there are some uh, words in our sentences that, well, it's hard to figure out what exactly they stand for. What does the word and stand for? What does the word if stand for? What does the word therefore stand for? And it seems like what you're saying is that Augustine was similarly worried about 
what might happen if we overgeneralize from this pretty intuitive and workable picture of how language works. Yeah, there are several things to note about what you just said. First of all, you're right, it's very important for Wittgenstein that this is not just Augustine's picture. It's a picture that's attractive and has been attractive for centuries to you know, people who think about language. And it's also a kind of picture that, for example, when you're teaching introductory courses in the philosophy of language, you often find yourself drawing these very simple pictures on the blackboard. You write, you know, you write the word language and draw a circle around it. You, you write the word world around it and draw a circle around it, and then you perhaps draw some arrows between the two circles. As an illustration, you know, this is a relation between language and reality. We're going to think about how that looks. And at that level, at that level of very primitive picture, I don't think Wittgenstein really thinks that we have already committed a mistake. I think he would say that that picture in itself can be applied in good ways and in bad ways, so to speak. So pictures for Wittgenstein is something that is at work at a very primitive level, and you can't really say that a picture is right or wrong, correct or incorrect. At one point in his remarks on the foundations of mathematics, he says, we don't judge the picture, but we judge by means of the picture. So we don't investigate the picture. We use it to investigate something else. So a picture is like perhaps something like a very simple paradigm that can be usefully applied, but can also be harmful if we cut it loose from its useful applications and try to think of it as a proto-theory to be developed into some sophisticated general view about language. In that way, the so-called Augustinian picture can be harmful if it's developed in certain ways. So it sounds like already what we have going on in the investigations is something quite different from what we're used to in philosophical texts. We're inclined to read this as the statement of a view followed by objections to it. And from what you've said already, it's clearly not that that's going on. I wonder if, just to get a clearer sense of what is going on, we could maybe run through one brief example of how this picture gets misapplied. So you've said Wittgenstein doesn't necessarily think anything's gone wrong when Augustine tells his story about how he learns language. So where do things start to go wrong? What's an example of that? I think Matt already made some useful examples here. You, if you generalize the picture, you say every word has a meaning, and this meaning is correlated with the word, and it is the object for which the word stands. Then problems arise about you know, words like and, it, and even property words like you know, red. Okay? And then if you hold on to this idea that there should be a correlate for every word, which is something like an object, then you will start perhaps postulating these correlates, like what's the object that the word red stands for? Well, is it redness or what is it? I mean, you start postulating perhaps more or less mysterious objects. Um, that might be the beginning of something that leads to philosophical confusion. You know? So that would be a very simple example of this. But Wittgenstein would surely say that there are much more sophisticated instances of this as well. So another philosopher that Wittgenstein quotes from and engages with in the beginning of the philosophical investigations is Plato. And here he cites a passage from Plato's dialogue, The Theatetus, where Plato has Socrates talk about this view that's been coming to him in a dream, according to which reality consists of simple parts, and those simple parts can only be named, they can't be described. So what use would you say Wittgenstein is making of that picture here, and is it similar to the use that he's making of the Augustinian picture of language on which the words in our sentences are essentially names of things? I think there are similarities and differences. One difference is that in the passage from Plato, you already have something like philosophy going on. It's not as unsophisticated as Augustine's. On the other hand, Socrates' relation to this picture, this passage, is interesting, I think, because he doesn't, it's not Socrates' view that is presented in this passage. This is something that Socrates have heard. So Socrates has second-hand opinion about this. He doesn't have knowledge. He doesn't fully understand what he has heard. And therefore, he calls it also a dream. So it's baffling to Socrates. And Socrates' immediate reaction, if you read on in the dialogue, is to say, we don't understand what this means. We have to try to make sense of it. And he wants to make sense of it as something that can also explain what knowledge is. So the idea is that to have knowledge of something is to know its constituents and how it is built up from those constituents. But in the end, Socrates 
fails to make sense of the picture in such a way, right? So the whole dialogue ends by, you know, aporia, as it's called. You know, we, we don't manage to answer the question we're trying to answer, namely the question, what is knowledge? So Socrates here is struggling with this picture or piece of primitive philosophical theorizing. And I want to argue that Wittgenstein conceives of himself as involved in a common struggle with people like Plato and Augustine and so forth. It's not that he's criticizing Augustine or Socrates or Plato. Rather, he is, by quoting these passages, suggesting that his struggle with these ideas is similar to Augustine's and Plato's. So it's not at all, I think, true to say that Wittgenstein is attacking Augustine's picture of language. (laughs) Wittgenstein isn't attacking Augustine. Wittgenstein isn't attacking Plato. He is participating in a struggle together with them. (laughs) Uh, He's also attracted by these pictures, but he ultimately thinks that they are harmful and he wants to find a way to free himself from them. But that's very similar to what Plato is trying to do in Theatetus, for example. So from what you've said, our initial conceptions of what is being done and who is being criticized in the investigations are actually likely to lead us astray. But from what you've said, one might have a worry of the form, well, what's the point of all of this, right? So if all that's going on is that these three guys, Plato, Augustine, and Wittgenstein, have had their struggles with various pictures, is what we get in the investigations of any more interest than a kind of confessional autobiography of Wittgenstein. What if someone were to say, well, sure, the theory that, for example, every word in language is a name is a crazy view to have, because how on earth do you account for and? So that's just a bad view. What we need to do is have a better theory. It's not clear why we should care about Wittgenstein's own struggles with these pictures. So what would you say to that kind of response? Yeah. Well, I think there are very many things going on in the philosophical investigations, and there are very many levels of discussion. So I think Wittgenstein would freely acknowledge that there is a level at which we provide arguments. He provides, like, reductios of certain views about, you know, how rules function and so forth, leading to paradoxes. So that's one kind of level at which you also have to engage as a philosopher. But I think Wittgenstein would say at at a very fundamental level, these pictures are at work, you know, at at, a more or less unconscious level. We might be conscious of the pictures, but we sometimes fail to note how much they determine our way of thinking about language. So if someone says it's a crazy view that every word is a name, then Wittgenstein would say, well, in a sense you're right perhaps, but the picture is still in a way unassailable because it can always be you know, made more sophisticated. You can say, well, okay, it's a kind of name. It names not an object, but say a function or, or <laughs> something like that. So if you try to give counterexamples, I think the picture in itself is so primitive and simple, so the counterexamples can always be accommodated by you know, elaborating the picture a little. So you know, it doesn't sound like this crazy thing, but you know, it's still an elaboration of the picture. So I think at the level of pictures, counterexamples are not very... At least they cannot be direct counterexamples. I guess a mass of counterexamples can put pressure on a picture because you have to add epicycles, so to speak. You have to make it more and more artificial in order to account for all these counterexamples. But still, I don't think a picture is not to be conceived as a thesis that can be straightforwardly contradicted in, by means of you know, counterexamples or descriptions of how we use language or anything like that. So we've been working with an implicit contrast here between the idea of a picture, which of course doesn't mean like a photograph or a painting, but picture in the sense of maybe set of intuitions about something or an intuitive sense of how something is or how something works. So the contrast has been between a picture, a philosophical picture and a philosophical theory. And the idea seems to be that a philosophical theory is more detailed and maybe the purport of a philosophical theory is more general. So it attempts to account for all kinds of cases Thus, it's more vulnerable to counterexample than a picture would be. A picture is just sort of a vague, intuitive starting point, as it were. So one standard conception of what philosophy is, is maybe you'd start with that set of intuitions, and then you try to develop it the way that you just suggested one might. So, for example, I start with an intuitive picture of how language works. Every word is a name for something. And then someone comes along with a counterexample, and, and then I refine my picture by adding more detail to it, saying, oh, no, and is a, the word and denotes a truth function. 
thus I've accommodated the counterexample. So that's one standard idea of how philosophy works. But we're contemplating the possibility of another idea of how philosophy works. Maybe there's something else for a philosopher to do besides just add more detail. What would that alternative look like exactly? That's a very good and central question to ask about Wittgenstein's philosophy, and it's a very difficult question to answer. I would want to qualify what you said about the relation between pictures and theories. It's not just that pictures are sketchier or simpler. I think there is a more principled step that you take when you go from a picture to a theory. A picture is a way of looking at things, but not something that you really... I mean, when Wittgenstein discusses pictures, he says, I don't dispute the correctness of the picture. Because the picture is, as it were, too primitive to be either correct or incorrect. It's a way of thinking about things that might be fruitful, might be well applied, but might also be harmful. A theory, on the other hand, is of course something that can be disputed. Right? You can give a counterexample to a theory, I think, if it's a theory with a clear content. So in a, in a sense, pictures are empty in a certain sense. And that's a really difficult question. I mean, some Wittgenstein commentators think that we should try to do without pictures. Wittgenstein's goal is to get rid of the pictures, right, and just be satisfied with the everyday use of language without any pictures. Other commentators have argued that Wittgenstein wants to replace one picture by another picture. So someone like Gordon Baker is a very famous Wittgenstein commentator. In his later writings argues that, you know, the notion of meaning as use, which is something for which Wittgenstein is very famous, is also a picture, no? It's a way of looking at language that Wittgenstein would think of as less harmful than the notion of language as names of objects, right? But then there is a third way of reading Wittgenstein, saying that pictures are inevitable. We always have pictures, and there is nothing wrong with pictures themselves. So the picture of language as consisting of names that picture has a place as long as we don't use it to try to construct philosophical theories about language, right? It might be a way of orienting ourselves in our language without philosophical pretensions. I, I'm really troubled by, how to, how to, by this question. I don't have a clear answer to it. I find problems in all these three kinds of answers. There is clearly in Wittgenstein the idea that at that level of philosophizing, it's not clear that we're actually arguing against anyone, arguing against each other. He talks of, you know, philosophy at that basic level as a matter of, you know, a problem of the will rather than of the intellect or something like that. So we have to simply, we want to develop this Augustinian picture in a way that leads to confusion, you know, but we should resist that. But that's really something that we might be convinced to resist, but not not really argued in a rational way to resist. All these are extremely difficult things, and it's, this is really what makes Wittgenstein's philosophy so difficult to understand and to uh, relate to, I mean, contemporary philosophical debates. What would Wittgenstein say about that? I mean, that's a difficult question. So you might object to what we're calling the Augustinian picture on the grounds that, oh, it's not the case that every word is a name of something. You know, maybe I think that every word is a predicate or something, you know, instead of a name. So on, on one idea of uh, what it is to engage in philosophical debate, where your interlocutor went wrong is that they gave the wrong theory, and I have a better theory. Whereas on Wittgenstein's conception of, you know, what philosophy is about or can be about, the thing to do isn't necessarily to call the other person out on having the wrong theory, but to make them aware of how their intuitions might be, as it were, bewitching them. It's very tricky to see when does a picture become philosophically contentious. Consider some other pictures. The picture of thinking as a process that goes on inside one's head. That's a picture Wittgenstein mentions. Or the picture of infinity as something very large. And he, he says both these pictures are harmful and misleading, at least potentially. In the infinity case, I would say that already there, if you think of infinity as something very large, there seems to be some kind of philosophizing going on, even if a seven-year-old child can think of infinity in that way. It's almost irresistible to think of infinity in that way. Is it already something to be criticized philosophically? Or I mean, one way of understanding Wittgenstein would be to say, as long as we're not troubled about thinking of infinity in this way, as long as, you know, it's, it might even be fruitful if we're developing some mathematical theory or something, so as long as we don't feel troubled about it, it's really okay. <laughs> and as long as we don't feel troubled about thinking as something that goes on in, in one's head, 
that's fine too. I mean, maybe we even use that picture to develop some very interesting, you know, theory of cognitive science or something. I don't know. I don't know to what. When would Wittgenstein be critical of it? Is it only when we really run into confusion, contradiction, and really feel troubled about it? Well, maybe. So one suggestion that's been made about Wittgenstein by the French philosopher Pierre Hadot is that you can situate Wittgenstein in a very ancient tradition of doing philosophy. In fact, that would include Plato, but also philosophers prior to Plato, where philosophy was thought of in terms of spiritual exercises. So the goal of philosophical argumentation is never to build up a systematic theory that then we stick with. It's precisely to remove confusions, remove harmful ways of thinking, and to ascend to some kind of better state of being. One word that gets used is the word ataraxia, the idea of a kind of tranquility. Does that seem a fruitful comparison to you, the idea that it's an idea that might seem comical to many contemporary philosophers, but perhaps it's the closest we can get, that for Wittgenstein, philosophy really is a kind of spiritual exercise. We're trying to work on ourselves. Does that seem right? I think that's right. It all depends on how exactly you spell out the notion of spiritual exercise, because you shouldn't describe Wittgenstein as someone who never argues, who never, you know, has good counterexamples and so forth. There is this argumentative level, too, I think, in Wittgenstein's philosophy. But I think at bottom it's right that he does not want to construct theories. He wants to reach a state of tranquility, rather. The question is whether he thinks that's really doable. Can you really reach such a state, or will it only be, you know, a sort of temporal maybe you can have tranquility at certain moments but then philosophical troubles will start bothering you again but sure i i think there is something right about that there is also an interesting connect i mean i think in plato's dialogue plato is constantly working with pictures pictures are compared and the theaetetus is full of pictures you know the aviary the wax block and the very these very famous pictures of the human mind for example and i think that's clearly an affinity with wittgenstein too Martin Gustafsson, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. To listen to future episodes of Elucidations, you may consult our website at philosophy.uchicago.edu slash podcasts.